Good day, and welcome to Student Manager 101 Codes, the last of five parts. We are almost through all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a final exam, you know, rush to the end. Well, Lori, thank you for helping to put this together. This is the capstone, I guess, uh, of the system. Uh, we'll be talking about coding. And again, uh, of all the parts that we do, I, I guess uh, we're going to certainly tell you why we think it's an important issue. Um, oh, my bad. I am finally the presenter. Let me get back up to where we were here. So uh, are we there? Are we there yet? Yes, it took a minute right. to flip. So. OK, very good. So uh, what we're going to do today, um, I, again, I, I guess the big thing for me is emphasizing the importance of coding. And so certainly we're going to talk about um, hang on a second, get my, get my stuff together. We're going to talk about the big picture and how this all fits. Or they kind of keep track, we'll try to clarify that. And I'm going to really, Lori, I'm going to pull a twist here. We're going to really kind of go in and screen by screen uh, take a look at uh, codes in these screens that you guys deal with every day. Make sure you're not overlooking the code <clears throat> and almost kind of a segue into next uh, webinar, which we're going to do in two weeks, which is on preferences. We're giving away the, the next one here. But, and then, of course, the functional parts, adding, reporting, cleanup, and some general tips. So that's what we're about. Hang on to your seats. As uh, Lori and uh, we typically, we move right along. So. Um, we will uh, get going. Big picture, and again, uh, no, uh, no surprise to anybody, but um, uh, what we're trying to do with Student Manager is organize, store, and help you retrieve data. And again, um, codes are part of that. Uh, and, and so again, we're going to kind of try to back, back away and look at the big picture, what it provides for you. Um, and again, the, the kind of things, if you code right and you keep track of the data, uh, what courses, where are people, who are people, what are their interests, uh, you know, what do our people look like? Well, if you, if you don't ask them the question or record it, it's kind of hard to get that kind of data out of a system. There is the garbage in, garbage out, which everybody's heard, the GIGO. But there's also, if you don't have any information, you're looking at a, a black hole. And again, uh, so, so capturing data, recording it is, is a big deal. Um, the, the, mantra, the mantra that I think we really try to emphasize is you code as much as you need. However, uh, if you don't have a reason for a code, don't code it. And again, it's, uh, codes are there for a purpose. And um, you know, asking for some particular piece of data because the director 10 years ago asked for it, uh, unless there's a reason that somebody needs it, it helps you manage your program, it helps you market your program, it help, unless a code helps you better serve your students or serve your master. And by that I mean your institution, the federal government, something that's asking you for data. Uh, to give you money or let you keep in business. Uh, again, that's, that's why you have codes. All right. Technically, any field in Student Manager, any data field, the name, the course, the register, the pay, is a code. Uh, <clears throat> we typically think of codes as fields in the screens that are validated. You know, you have the drop downs that you're entering and in particular data. Uh, generally, there is an unlimited number of code definitions. Lori, you with me? I'm here. Oh, I thought I heard a buzz there. Uh, generally, you have an unlimited number of code definitions uh, as set up by you within the code setup area, which we're going to get to. Am I getting an echo, Lori, or is that just me? Am I just sound you. clear? I can try to minimize it if you'd like. OK, I, it, every once in a while, it seems to have an echo. Um, and certain code areas, for instance, interest codes on the name record and faculty, grouping codes on the course, you can have an unlimited number of codes for any one person or any one course. And Chuck, then finally, Chuck, codes Chuck. are universal. Everybody who is 
logging into Aceware, student manager, will see and use the same codes. Uh, and again, most codes can be activated. The only caveat to the universal codes, and we're going to talk about this, is scoped interest codes. And uh, I'm excited about, I think, what that can provide, and we'll give you a little review of it. Hey, Chuck, All right. can we stop for just a moment? Sure, we are sure. getting an echo, and we're getting some folks telling me about it that they're getting a lot of feedback as well. Um, Do you want me to call back in? Or I, uh, you sound Greg, fine. Are, you and Greg are both on. Would you check to make sure that your speakers are muted? Oh, Greg, yeah, mine, I don't have a mic, so. Uh, yeah, but your speaker's on your computer. Sometimes that will do it. Oh, I will shut those, I will shut those down. Okay. Same. Okay, okay. I'm off. Greg? <clears throat> and if somebody would let Check me know one, if that's any better I'm at all. I'm still getting a little bit of, <clears throat> a little bit of buzz on that. Um, you want to? People telling us that's better, so something. All right. Still getting some, but it's it's some better. So tolerable. Uh, if, it, if it continues, I'll let you know, and folks, if you would let me know, because I'm not getting any at all. Lucky. There's an There's odd a... little uh, latent buzz here, but all right, back to the show. So when we talk about codes, one of the things we want to emphasize is that in the preferences area, and again something that we're going to cover next uh, webinar, uh, you've got to pay attention to that. Because if you've turned off a field, nobody can see it, nobody can use it. So uh, we'll cover that. And again, the reminder about preferences, black and blue, uh, user level, and then the global only done by the admin. Now, a couple of things that we always want to emphasize, if you're going to do coding, if you're not going to do anything else, I am a believer, add a subject code to a course. Uh, and that will allow you to be able to then have, anytime you have a subject code on the course, any student who registers for that class will automatically get an interest code on their name record. And that allows you to cross-pollinate the names and be able to build target lists of people who uh, would be prospects for classes in that particular subject area. So again, that's a huge one. So again, feed the course, the course feeds the name, and that will feed all your marketing down the road and statistical reporting, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so, so that is the big deal why we really, really encourage you to put a subject code on a course. Uh, other coding relationships, uh, source code, tracking code. On the name record, the code we talk about is source code. Now again, both the source code and the tracking code go to the same code lookup list. Uh, on the name, it's considered, how did this name first hear about your institution? Why did Lisa Avery's name in the database? Well, it's because she was referred by another student. The tracking code is when they enroll in a class, it tells you what was the promotion that brought the student to register for this particular class, Mastering Student Manager. On a new student, the first time you add the student and the first time they take that class, that tracking code and source code are probably going to be the same. But the idea is that in second and subsequent registrations a year from now, six months from now, Lisa Avery might have gotten a mailing or a personal email notice, or she may have gone in and got it from the web where she found out about this class. And that is what allows you to do your marketing tracking where you allocate your resources for marketing and promotion. <coughs> I'm going to stop, Lori, and see if anybody has any other comments or questions on that, because again, that sometimes gets uh, people tied up in knots sometimes yet, but we can give it a few moments if you'd like and see if they, because questions take time to type sure, in. Sure, yeah, 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 so. yeah. Well, um, well, just, well, I'll hold them until the end, because I don't uh, see anything coming. And nothing on. coming. All right, well, um, next, uh, the, the same list of choices, we talked about that, that uh, and we'll cover that when we start to edit the codes themselves. Um, one, <coughs> one 
source code per name, uh, one tracking code per registration, and again, reiterate what it is we've been talking about. <clears throat> Occupation and organization. Now, these are codes that aren't necessarily related, but they tell you about the type of organization that employs the person. And again, this is a really big deal. Uh, occupation code and organization code. Occupation is what type of job this person has. Uh, and again, those two code areas I think are really, really, really important, especially if you do business and professional programs. Because knowing about what type of job they have, what their, their job responsibilities are, knowing about what type of an industry, what type of company they come from, will help your program staff uh, build classes, do marketing uh, for those programs. Um, and that's kind of reiterating what we've talked about. I guess I have those slides in twice. Uh, interest codes, uh, another big, big deal. And again, as we said earlier, if you put in a source code or a subject code in the class, subject code in the class, whenever a person takes that class, they automatically have an interest code added to their name record. You, of course, can add codes independently as a staff person or the student when they go online and, and look at their account on the web, on ACEweb, they can add interests. And again, these interest codes are ones that you can run mailing lists from, you could do email blasts from, you could export emails to a file if you're using constant contact or third party uh, e-marketing tools. So again, a great tool. The big, big deal on this is interest code scoping. And the idea here is that you can define categories of interest codes and then use them to, um, use them to manage a large set of codes. I'm going to roll over to manager for this. So again, um, in the codes area for interest codes, names, interest codes, uh, a program can have lots of interest codes. Uh, I have 30 or 40 in my demo. I know I've seen some schools with literally hundreds of interest codes. One of the things you can do now is to create a scoping code to assign to an interest code. Okay, well, why would you do that? Uh, several reasons. I can say, number one, if you have a large number of codes and the codes might be categorized into different areas, for instance, general mailing list type codes and topic codes. Maybe you've got, like Canton, two different programs using the same student manager, a health pro programs or nursing <clears throat> and a general adult ed. Well, you could assign an adult ed code to the adult ed code, to alt ed subject interest codes. You could assign a health programs code to those that have to do with the health or the nursing side. OK, so far so good. What's cool is that when you're logged in <clears throat> as whoever you are, Chuck, Sam, Bill, you can go into your preferences on the names table and say, when I log in, I'm mainly interested in seeing the business and industry program codes when I go in to do a drop down for interest codes or subject codes for um, a, a student. So I'm going to assign the business code to my record here. <clears throat> Close out of this, come back to my record. So when I click Add Interest Code, the only codes I see in this list, out of you saw 30 or 40 that were in the total list, are the codes that are scoped as business. Now when I'm in here, I say, well, I, I want to look to see what the nursing programs are doing. There's the health codes. Here are the general mailing list codes. Again, <clears throat> primarily a way to help you manage um, larger lists of codes, kind of break it into chunks, be able to actually separate out codes um, 
for different program areas if you have multiple program areas. Again, SMU, uh, programs uh, that have Houston, programs that have multiple areas in the same system, this I think would be a very useful tool. Uh, Lori, any, any questions bubbling up on that? Anybody? I want to I wanna ask here. Raise your hand if you are doing anything with scoped interest codes right now. Raise your hand if you would, if you're, if you are. We've got a couple, all right? All right, very good, very good. Well, again, I, I happen to think that's a sleeper kind of feature as far as what it can provide for you. So I wanted to make sure we, we covered that. All right, uh, back to the name record. Here a code, there a code, everywhere a code code. Well, there are lots of user-defined codable fields on the name record, and I want to kind of make sure we review those. Um, occupation and organization code actually can be relabeled. So if you have a program, maybe it's a community ed program, where you don't, uh, occupation organization type isn't a big deal, but you might want to record resident or non-resident <clears throat> and keep that up in the main name screen, uh, you can repurpose those. Name code one, general purpose character code. Uh, name code two, general purpose character code. That is one that actually, if you were doing social security numbers, remember, that code could be encrypted. And again, we're going to hit this more next uh, couple weeks in the preferences um, uh, webinar. Language code, uh, member type or member number, again, user-defined field. <clears throat> the badge name now. If you remember, we have Matthew now allows you to relabel the tag on badge name. So if you don't care about badge name, but maybe you want the uh, maiden name for, for women uh, students, um, you want to record a maiden name. Uh, name char one, this is basically a general purpose character field. Again, these are all ones that you can uh, define the label and store the code in there that you want. Uh, more codes on the Demographics 2 field. Now again, um, on the name screen you have Demographics 1, Demographics 2, lots of codes on this second field. The default codes relate to primarily demographics kind of tying into iPads and some of the vocational technical reporting that a lot of schools need to do. But, but again, if, you, if that does not apply to you, you can go in, um, use the preferences area, relabel these, and use them for, to store uh, information that's relative or important to what you're doing. <clears throat> and uh, the point about this, some of these codes are two digits long, some are one digit, some are three. So you've got two, one, I think that's a two, one, one, think that's two, that's a three, a three. Uh, so again, depending on what type of data you might need to store in there, you can find an appropriate code, label it the way you want, <clears throat> and uh, start tracking your data. Um, and of course, don't forget additional info, the user-defined fields, uh, the 20 user-defined fields. And of course, technically the credential area, which is of course the brand new option in 72A are, are codable. You put in codes, uh, define elements to store. All right, uh, Lori, any buzz happening that are relevant right now? We're going to hold everything till the All right. end. Uh, membership codes. Um, again, uh, the part of the Demographics 2 screen, there's a webinar on that. There's good help on that. Speaking of help, speaking of help, um, from the help guide, from the help guide, and I've got the help guide open, under student manager topics, there is a huge section on codes. So again, um, if you're wanting to read up more, uh, it's there. It's there for your benefit. Uh, courses. We are now on the course side. And again, not quite as many user defines on the main screen, although uh, for the instance, the code category. You can't label the the label. The label is called category, but you can kind of you can well, you can kind of you can define what it is that you want to store there that would help you 
analyze or separate or group together for reporting the classes that you're running. Uh, Cochar, uh, it's a, that is completely definable. You can relabel uh, the tag on it. And the coordinator field. Coordinator field has a um, default label, which would be the course coordinator who's the staff member responsible for the class. But if you say, there's only one of us, and so I want to use it for something else, go for it. You can relabel that and uh, assign whatever value to it. And again, don't forget the user-defined fields that are available on the course. Register. There we go. Register. Uh, again, on the main screen, really a couple of codes. Uh, registration code and the miscellaneous code. Um, again, uh, smaller space-wise fields, uh, but those are ones you can modify. Uh, one of the new features, and I don't have a shout out on this, is that remember on the status code field, you can now make that um, open entry and non-validated. And um, we'll talk the business, but you know, the advantages, disadvantage of open entry and validated. And um, well, I, and, and I can discuss that if there's some questions on that down the road. I think I'll, I'll pass on that right now. All right, uh, we're ready to move on, Lori. Anything related to this you want to highlight or cover or kind of explain if there's a lot of questions on? I, I think we're, those questions are slow coming in. I think we're just going right. to hold everything. Keep on moving. Yeah. And again, user-defined fields on the register screen. And again, I, uh, I don't think we've got any new people, but let me real quick show you. When we're talking about user-defined fields, um, in the additional info area, there are 20 on the name record. Um, we talked about credential. This is that credential area where you can create categories of records and add as many as you want for a person. On the register screen, you've got additional info. Again, 16 user-defined fields. And then on the course side, uh, there are, again, 20 user-defined fields, uh, no, 16 on the, on the course side. So again, uh, options for you in terms of where to store your data. Uh, adding codes. All right, so we know where the codes are. How do we put in a code that we can pick from uh, on validated code areas? And, and I, I guess I am want to I am want to go back on this. When we say validated, the distinction between a validated and unvalidated is that a validated field you can only enter or select something that is provided for you in a drop down. So again, if I decided I wanted to call this a, a fish, I'm going to look down here. We have no fish codes for this particular occupation. So if I try to type fish in here, if I, I can't do that. Uh, open entry code. An open entry code, I can type whatever I want. I can call this fish. I can call this chicken. I can call this vegetarian. I could spell it. But again, open entry field, uh, type anything you want in there. Now, for codes that are validated, the primary method is to go to module codes and pick the code you want, uh, enter it, and now that make it active, and that code will be in the drop-down list the next time you bring up that record. Method number two is that if you have permission to add codes, and this has to do with your user access level as set up by your student manager administrator, the plus sign is there, and you can add a code on the fly. And again, opens up the code editor, and that allows you to, to enter in codes. Now, let's go back to the live system and kind of go through that. So. Uh, if we wanted to add a new interest code through the normal add edit process, we'd go to reports, add edit codes, uh, go to the universal code editor, click the drop down. It's alphabetized by the file. So we go course, fees, financial aid, firm, ledger, there's names, and we're looking for interest codes. Say so now we've got the interest codes. 
I can add a code. I can find to see if I've got fish in my code set. I don't. So if I wanted to add fish for a code, if I S H any kind. Okay. Uh, I guess I should. Yeah, I guess most fish have fins. Uh, and I could make it active. And if you have Ace Web, you need to decide, is this a code that you want to put on your Ace Web pages for people to uh, sign up for or not? And if you're using uh, scoping, do you want to do any particular scope on this? Is this just for adult programs? We're going to fish them or not? Or uh, going to leave it open kind of for everybody? Hit the OK button. And now when we go back to the name record uh, and we go to the list, and I've got to, there's, there's, the, there's the fish, the general one, the finny kind. It's, it's in the list. OK. Um, the editing codes. Now, this is something, um, putting the codes in is one thing, but the codes change. You, there's a reason why you might want to change fish to, uh, to aquatic or, or uh, seafood instead of fish, or uh, I, I don't know what else to call fish. Um, so if you wanted to do that then, and we go back to the code editor, and find the one we're looking for. Uh, when you start to edit a code, um, one of the biggest mistakes people made is that they'll get to the code area and they say, well, I need to add a new code of a bird. Now, if you start to edit an existing code, you know that you're in edit mode when it warns you, hey, Bozo, this will change all the references. Are you sure you want to do this? And what that would do is that all those fish that you've coded in there, bass and halibut and salmon, would suddenly be called birds. And people would look at you really kind of funny when you come up with Mr. Salmon and it says he's a bird. Anyway, so that is something to pay attention to. If you're going to edit a code, the edit system will automatically change that code on any people that have been assigned that code to the new value for the code. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. If you really had intended to keep fish and add a new code of bird, you want to oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. And you would click Add to then add the code of bird, and then you're on your way. Uh, Lori, any other, Greg, any other comments on that that you want to highlight? Because that is something that uh, people can get in trouble on if they're not paying attention. We should probably note that it doesn't actually say, hey, bozo. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I want to scare them into paying attention here. So, OK. Uh, so again, pay attention to the adding versus adding piece. All right, so again, as we said, if you've got codes, what are you going to do? You need to report them. Um, there are several areas where you can get lists of the codes themselves. Under the reporting codes, there are uh, reports where basically it'll just print out a list of the codes in each of the different areas for kind of a reference. Um, one of the other ways, and uh, the way that I like actually, so the code reporting will just give you a list of all the codes that you have created, OK? What I like is to go into, for names or courses, go into names at the statistical report. So if I said, I want to look at occupational codes of my students and see what ones are in the database, I'll run a statistical report on them. Summary report, OK. And I want to run all names just to see what codes are out there. We're going to skip the money because we're not referencing the payments. So this particular statistical report tells me how many people in my database have, a, um, have that particular code on their name record. And so again, dog, educator, I don't have any fishes. I don't have any birds in this list. But that will tell you the codes that are in the system as far as reporting. And again, if you were doing a including registrations, say if you were doing the analysis on all registrations from a time frame, 
you could actually do an analysis of how many registrations your executive coded people brought or brought in or paid you versus the schmucks or the 47% um, who are bringing in. So again, uh, that is what the codes are for. Now, Greg made a good point that, and, and this is back at the Gestalt area, uh, one of the important things I think to think about is um, building codes when you're working with your student manager, and hopefully this should have happened when you first started using it, is you basically write down on a sheet of paper or you, you sit down and you say, what is the mission of our organization? Is it to be able to uh, generate more enrollments? Uh, is one of the missions is that we do federal funded programs and the feds are going to need all of the demographics about ethnicity, disability, et cetera, uh, for the reporting. And of course, that's what drives the descriptions of the codes. That's what drives the, um, that's what drives the, uh, you know, how exactly you use those codes is to, uh, identify what it is they want to track, and then focus on that. Um, now, I'm going to also kind of, while I'm on this, um, go sideways and say, one of the things that I think, uh, back to that business of asking for information that, that people, uh, only asking for information that people want. I've seen some registration forms, and I should have picked an example, uh, online where they ask for everything, including your waistband size and your last, uh, the last time you kissed a girl. I mean, they're just ridiculous, in my opinion, what it is they ask their students to fill out in order to take a class on duck hunting or cook Chinese cooking. And again, so uh, back to the ask what you want, but only ask what you're going to use. Um, the flip side of that is, if it's information that you can use, ask for it. So again, if you have programs, maybe some of them are business, some of them are personal, put in your registration blank. Put on the web form. To help us better serve you, tell us a little bit about yourself and ask them for what type of job they have, what type of business they work for. You know, uh, maybe you don't want to ask their birthday, but you might ask, what is your year of birth, uh, you know, and again, that, the year of birth is relatively uh, painless uh, if you ask for a full birth date. Now, sometimes you have to if it's required by statute, but if you can just get by asking for birth year, what you do is you enter in just 0101, you have to enter in something as a day and a month, but you just put in January 1st, and you put in the birth year, and then you can run your analysis of age of students, age profiles, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as part of that. So again, don't be bashful about asking for data that you're going to use, data that will help you um, serve your students. Um, and again, Greg comes up again with this idea of following the KISS rule. Keep it simple. Keep it straightforward. Uh, if you can't give them a reason why that's important to you and why it's okay for them to share that with you, uh, be, because it helps you build the programs that they need and can use and can benefit from. And, and again, that's if you turn the focus on the student, you know, why is it important to them? Well, we'll, we'll only send you information, and then if you follow through, we'll only send you information related to your interests then, of course, you go, well, absolutely. I don't want to learn about, if I'm a cook, I don't want to learn about duck hunting. I just want to learn about Chinese cooking and, and you know, uh, designing kitchens and all this kind of stuff and vice versa. But you, you get the point. Um, all right. Uh, code reporting. Uh, and again, oh, viewing from the edit code. This is something I wanted to, wanted to make sure to hit. When you're in the code editor, so if we say, I want to go to... Uh, back to interest codes, name interest codes, and I'm saying, here's an interest code. If I wanted to know how many people have that interest code, you could run a report, you could go to reports, 
uh, demographics, you could find a report, do a query, how many people, yada, yada. If I just want to know, interest code, ASWARE. On the code field itself, you'll have a show name draw, show courses, and maybe show registrations, depending on what the code is. So if I said show name draw, how many you want to sort it by last name? 47 names have that code. So you can just set right here at the interest code area, next code, appearance enhancement, name, three names. OK. So again, you can run through this one by one and see. In cases where, again, the interest code and the subject code on the course are the same, how many courses have this? Show courses, only one. But again, that is another handy tool especially if you're inheriting a system that's been around for years and you're really saying, does anybody care anymore about this particular code? <clears throat> you could go in and look at the codes and then be able to see how many people have that. OK, we're getting about to the end and we can get into questions. But part of that process of, 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 of coding is maintenance, cleanup. Codes are like, or data, I always say databases are like gardens. Um, if you don't pay attention to them, they will get grown up with weeds. They'll get cluttered. You can't find what you're really looking for. You can't find the turnips under the, the weeds and the kochia and the sunflower and the great big nasty stuff that grows up if you're not cleaning it, if you're not pruning it, not working in it and doing some maintenance. You just got to do that, folks. And again, manager gives you some really nice tools to do that. So under the tools area, <clears throat> tools, data cleanup, code areas, uh, you've got a number of different code areas that you can go into and say, well, I want to go into the interest codes. And you can see, well, how many of these uh, how many of these have we used? Greg says his rule, if you haven't used a code in the last uh, year or two, get rid of it. Uh, you know, unless there's something magical about historical value, uh, at least deactivate it. Yeah, again, now the, the deactive status, I guess maybe explain that. What, what is the active deactive status? The big deal, I'm going to get out of this. When you're working with codes, the active or not active status determines, does it appear in the drop-down list when you're adding or editing or, or assigning codes to a name? So if we were to now go into the code area, I think I can do this. Name, 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 occupation codes, find cat, and I say, ah, we're not using cat anymore. We've eliminated animals. We're not, we don't care about the cats and the dogs out there anymore. I don't think, do I have the fish in there? Nope, I didn't have a fish. OK, so I deactivated those. Now when I drop, do the drop down, I may have to refresh. Now I have to close the screen and refresh. Come back, have to check, click the drop down. Fish and dog are gone. Now, if I had assigned that code to anybody, it would still be there. But it wouldn't be in the list for me to assign to new people. And so that is kind of the beauty of the, the active deactive element is that you can, if you think it might be useful for, or you need it historically, but it's really not something you're assigning now, go into the code and deactivate it. Um, OK, back to the cleanup. Now, I'm going back data cleanup, going into codes, and we're going to interest subject. And you say, well, in, in thinking about it, you've decided that you really don't want the darn, oh, that was an occupation code. I'm sorry, occupation code. You've really decided you're going to get rid of it. So if you're saying, I want to select cat, and I want to select dog, and I just want to delete it. You can do that. Hit the delete button, and it's gone. Um, now, let's say uh, architect. Now, maybe you had an architect program, but you're no longer doing it. So you want to deactivate those. So you pick architect. Who else are we going to do? 
sorry, sorry, we're, we're no longer doing journalism training. We're out of the medical training business, and we change. But you're going to keep the codes on these people because the anyway for historical purposes. But by making it not active, that will then automatically change that status. Uh, now, the other thing that you can do with this, and I should have made a backup before I can tell I'm going to need to, because uh, I might want to bring my codes back. But if you wanted to combine codes, if there was some reason you said Cisco and computer, they're really the same thing anymore. Um, you can click on the first code that you want to combine. The last code you click is the one that you want to complete. You want to uh, replace with. And so you have code value description. If you hit replace now, every one of these code fields that are highlighted, I only have two, but would be combined and basically Cisco would be replaced by computer. And maybe I want to give it a new name. Instead of computer or Cisco, I want to call it IT Tech. And that will be computers and Cisco and XX, whatever you're going to do. So again, you can combine codes, you can delete codes, you can deactivate codes, and you can rename codes through this data cleanup tool. Um, and again, if you're a little nervous about that, feel free to consult with your tech. Uh, and they can kind of talk you through it and, of course, recommend you make a backup before you do some heavy-duty uh, data in here. But again, great tool for you to use as you're doing your, your cleanup of the system. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, Greg, Lori, any other thoughts on that? And again, Greg's rules, not used in a year and a half, dump it or deactivate it. All right. I think we're pretty good. All right, moving on. I think um, we've gone through the cleanup, coding tips. Again, back to the mantra, you know, use it or lose it. Use it or get rid of it. Uh, create as many as you want. Use as many as you're going to use. Um, use as many. I'm going to go back to that. One of the things about coding, and, and you'll come back, you say, oh, I'm all excited now. Chuck's got me all excited, and well, I'm going to go in and do a bunch of coding. Uh, Bite off as much as you can chew. Uh, so if, if you're wanting to get into coding, one of the strategies in this is, and I'm going to get out of this to the name record, do it in chunks. You say, well, right now, the first thing I want to do is focus on source code, occupation, and organization, and birthday and gender. Okay, so you're going to focus on those five things. Get yourself, get your staff into the habit of working on those particular fields. Then next semester, you say, well, now I'm going to work on some of these de demographic codes. Now I'm going to work on some particular, I don't know, future needs codes. So again, do it in stages. Because if you really try to do you know, kind of like the casual jogger who decides they're going to run a marathon tomorrow, you've got to kind of train. You've got to kind of build up you know, to the, to the total thing. So feel free to do it in stages. <clears throat> and again, character space, um, a lot of code fields are a fairly decent length. Uh, for instance, interest is 10, subject to, or the occupation is 6. Don't get too concise. You, there's no penalty. You don't save any space by using a short code than you do by doing a, a longer code that might be a little bit more uh, clear for a person looking at it. Um, related to that, especially with interest codes, uh, the idea of a major minor. So if you wanted to start with the first four or five digits of the code as a major category, EDU for education, DANC for dance, BUS for business, <clears throat> then you add an, an appendage to it, a, a subcode, for the category. So education, ADM, K-12, ELE for elementary, CSL is education counseling. That allows you, when you're running a report, to use the course number or the code begins with. You can say, if the code begins with EDUC, give it to me. 
Well, that'll give you everybody who has any inkling of education and or interest in. And if you said, well, now I'm only interested in the K through 12 folks, you could put EDUC K12, and that would drill down and only give you those folks who are in the um, K-12 area of the education area, uh, the education subset. Uh, coding tip, we talked about the view area, show names, show courses as a quick way to see what's associated. Um, <clears throat> and the reminder about relabeling occupation and organization. And again, um, coding and back to the idea about weeding your garden. Um, Maybe life insurance. They always say you should reevaluate your life insurance based on changes in your family. Well, if your organization has changed its focus from maybe more of a community ed to more of a business and professional, you probably want to go in and change those cooking or bonsai plants, uh, deactivate them. Maybe you might want them later, but then activate codes that have to do with you know marketing, you know supervision and leadership. Uh, you know, lean management, um, Cisco, IT tech, you know, add the codes, update the codes to match up with the mission of what your organization is doing. And again, it's just, uh, you know, if your codes have to do with Smith Corona typewriter and uh, uh, Remington typewriters <clears throat> for the type of organization that you're in, that probably needs to be updated. Incidentally, those are all typewriters that are manual ones. They are no longer, uh, there are no computers called Remington or, uh, 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 I forget the, the, the one I mentioned there. All right, that kind of wraps up coding. We've got a few minutes. Lori, uh, tell us what people are thinking about. Uh, people want to know if you relabel a field, uh, UDF, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, if you relabel a field, uh, can you still report on it? I, absolutely, uh, you know, and again, um, the, the 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 reporting issue is now. I say relabel or, or activate, deactivate. It was it was it, and that might be. They're saying relabel. Well, relabeling what you call the field on the screen does not change what's in the field and whether it can be reported or not. Uh, it's completely independent. So no. The only thing to pay attention is is things like user-defined fields. If if we go in and try to run a report, so if I had name code two as the label for this second field, the actual field, if I'm going to modify a report, the the name of the field will not say name code two. The name of the field will be. Um, the code field name in the student manager data set. That happens to be NM code one or NM code two. And again, in the in in for you as a user, being able to monitor this, I refer you to the help guide. Go to the screen layout, go to the screen you're looking for, and then you hover over the field. Okay, the first one is NM code one, is the actual name. The second one is NM code two, <clears throat> but yeah, no. That what you label the field does not affect in any way your ability to report on it. Uh, it's whether there's data in the field <clears throat> is what determines that. Very good. If a course has started and students are enrolled, can you still go back and add an interest code, and will it stamp on the student name? We we missed the first three words of what you said there. If a course has already started and students oh. are enrolled, yes, uh, there is that we have a we have a we have a grace we have a grace for you on that. <clears throat> Let me get out of this now. <clears throat> uh, and I've got I've got codes on all of my all of my classes. But if you have a class that already has students in it, and you're saying, "Oh crap, I forgot to put an interest code," or again. <clears throat> you're halfway through the semester and you say, oh, well, uh, I'd never done this, but I want to add them after the fact. You can do that. Now, the other trick is, here I have one already in there. I'm going to go ahead and delete the code, save it. 
Okay, so if I do, I want to add a code of communications to this and hit the Save button, it will say, you have changed or you have added a subject code. Do you want to apply this code to all existing registrants? So absolutely. And in fact, for those of you who say, well, I would like to add two subject codes to the students in this class. Maybe it's a multidisciplinary course and you had to choose either law or computers. It was a, uh, a, a computer, uh, it was a, a IT uh, licensing rules with legal issues, blah, blah. You could apply then a second subject code by just editing the primary putting in the secondary and then say yes, and it will automatically stamp that code in all of the existing students. So uh, the answer to that was, you betcha, absolutely. Very good. Linda would like to see a course code transmogrification, please. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've waited yeah. my whole life to use that one. <laughs> For a course code transmogrification. Uh, 09 uace one a OK. So the idea of what the course code transmogrification is, is that um, if you wanted to change the course code model <clears throat> and um, you say, I want to take the, I want to move the course code from, uh, there's three different ways to before code, after code. Okay, da, 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 da. I got to think about this because uh, there are different ways to do it. Um, so if I want to take all of the, 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 the 09 classes that are 09S for spring, and I want to call them 09P. Uh, so this is an example of all of the classes that are 09S. I want to change to 09P. Now, uh, what I can do now is do a test to see, are there any classes that would end up with a problem? Here's a previous course number. Here's what the new course number is going to be. So I can hit the Go number, and it changed that one class that was in my particular list. And I've got an error, but it took me right out of that. So again, the, the idea of the transmogrification, and I'm going to get back to it, is like we recommend that you use the year, the term, and the department code. If you wanted to say, I want to change all of the codes that were ACE to CPT, um, you could do that. You could do that with the transmogrification tool. Now again, uh, because those in, that involves some mass changes to your database, you would always want to um, make a backup before you get into this. And again, I would recommend that this is probably something you'd want to kind of talk about with your tech to make sure that what you're aiming to do uh, would allow you to do this. Now, a uh, tip on this. You say, well, I'd like to do some experimentation on real data. Make a backup of your live data, move it over to another folder on your computer, and um, test it. Let me let me get out of here to where. Do, 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 do. Yeah, go to your desktop, create yourself a new folder for a a play copy of your live data. Go into the play copy and experiment with that transmogrify tool uh, before you start running into it live. Uh, Gregor, you got any comments on that, Gregor? You say we're good. But again, it is a great tool, and again, allowing you to basically change around the format, um, change around the order of the different areas within your course codes. I believe we have come to the end of our questions. Okay. Well, let me let me give a highlight to uh, the next webinar. Uh, again, it'll be two weeks. Two weeks from today, we're going to do it in the afternoon, 1.30. I believe that will be central, that will be standard time now. Um, but we'll be going back into preferences. We kind of dallied, uh, we kind of dabbled in a, a little bit today, but we're going to really go into those preferences 
almost on a line by line basis. Um, we might this one, Larry, might be a forty, uh, a seventy five minute to a ninety minute one. So guys, uh, be prepared to be there an hour and fifteen, hour and forty five, or hour and a half, because we want to make sure that we cover it. Uh, it's a key, key element of making sure your student manager is set up to work for you. Uh, Greg, any any comments from the chat window? Uh, oh, Greg says backups are good. Yep, and the idea of being able to test test on a backup or test on a play or a practice copy of your live data. So, Lori, any other thoughts? Going once, going twice, we good? As you leave today, you'll be offered a survey for oh. our whole entire series, and I do Super. encourage to fill it out. I don't. I, I'm, I hate surveys myself, but it, it's important that we have feedback. Well, let's think about survey. This is basically uh, it, it's helping us guide. It's our codes, guys. You're giving us codes that will help us plan programs, and that's exactly what you're asking your students to do. So we're asking you to belly up to the bar here, pony up, fess up. Help us out, uh, give us some feedback, and we'll try to keep making this stuff better for you. So That's it. I'm good. All right. It's a wrap. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Greg. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.